The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, hello and welcome to this webinar delivered by the ISM Trust. I'm Francesca Christmas from Trinity College London and before we begin, we've got a few technical points to tell you. The first is you can't see us, but you should be able to see the PowerPoint presentation displayed on your screen. You should also be able to hear me, but I can't hear you. So if you experience any uh, technical difficulties, such as sound or quality issues, please let us know in the question box and we'll make any attempt we can to resolve the issue. If you have any questions related to the webinar subject, please type them in the questions box and we'll answer as many as possible at the end of the presentation. And any we don't get to, we will absolutely get back to you after the webinar. The webinar has been recorded and will be available to view on the ISM's website at ism.org slash webinars. So it's great to be here. Um, I'm Francesca and actually I'm not here uh, alone today. I'm in the room with Julia Martin, also from Trinity. Hello. And um, the wonderful Freya from ISM. Who Hello. Is steering the ship and making sure everything works smoothly. Um, we're here in the ISM's beautiful offices in West London, surrounded by natural woods and pale walls and feeling very Radio 4 about the whole thing, actually. So this, if it ends up sounding a bit like an extended version of sort of music exams, woman hour, so that, that's why. Um, so hopefully you all have a coffee in hand and you're sitting comfortably. Um, a quick bit about us so you know who you're listening to. Um, my name is Francesca and I'm Head of Academic Governance for Music at Trinity and I'm involved in the academic side of all our music education work with um, a particular responsibility for Europe and of course by extension the UK. Um, my background is in both instrumental and classroom teaching and in teacher education at, um, at HE level and also in research. Julia, who are you? I'm Julia Martin, hello. Um, I'm Head of Product at Trinity and what that means really is that I look after all of our music and drama syllabuses, um, the supporting resources that we create and put online, so all of our digital content and also our app for Rock and Pop, which I'll speak a bit about later. Um, my background is as a classically trained musician, then I went off to work in the music industry for a while um, and then actually went into teaching but at higher education level. So I was involved in higher education and contemporary music higher education for a long time um, and then have come to Trinity from there. Yeah. Great. Um, and this is the fourth and the last in the ISM's graded exam um, board series, which uh, presents both benefits and challenges, I think. Um, challenges in that uh, all our erstwhile colleagues have said all the good stuff already. Um, but that does mean we get to draw on the excellent content that's already there safely on the ISM website. And it gives us a bit more space in this hour to talk about um, perhaps what is most unique about Trinity. Um, so we've been busily drafting and redrafting our presentations since um, the first of the, um, the um, presentations from the ABRSM. And actually John Holmes um, uh, included a fantastic um, section in his presentation, looking at the, the sort of the place of graded exams um, within a broader understanding of progression and assessment. And I think that's useful for anyone using any grade. It's as pertinent to any of the exam boards. So I, I heartily encourage you to go and watch that one. And um, the other one I just wanted to pick up on was a section that Dan Francis included from uh, Dan from RSL. He spent some time on the um, sometimes unforgiving job of unpicking the RQF, the, the framework on which all the graded exams sit and where where they are in terms of comparability to other qualifications, etc. Uh, all things we had planned to cover, but now we don't have to. <laughs> so do go and have a look at those other videos too. So when Julie and I sat down to think about what might be most useful for you people who are giving up an hour of your time to listen to us, um, we thought that what we might perhaps try to do is answer the question, why use Trinity? What is it that Trinity offers 
um, that could be of use to you and your learners. And um, maybe what's unique about our qualifications? What might you not know about syllabuses, even if you're a diehard Trinity teacher and have been working with us for a long time, there are often hidden gems and things that are, are perhaps not so easily known. And this is a great opportunity for us to talk about some of those um, and maybe have the chance to discuss why they might be useful for, for teachers and learners. So this is aimed very much at teachers who have been working for us uh, with us for a long time or teachers who haven't worked with us and might be interested in exploring some of our syllabuses and, and hopefully it'll be as useful to both groups. One thing I will say is that what we have, what we are avoiding doing is a sort of very um, forensic dissection of the syllabuses because all of that information is easily available on the website and doesn't make for very exciting listening if we're really honest sort of mark scheme divisions and and um, those sorts of things so um if you there will be if you have questions about some of the detail then please do ask them in the question box um, and and most of the information you'll need is already on our website so this is how we're structuring our session and then we'll get on with it. Firstly, I'm going to start with an overview of how really how Trinity thinks. What are the principles and values that underpin the work we do in music? What impact do we hope they'll have? Um, and we hope that that might provide some insight into how the exams are set up to run the way they are and how you might most usefully engage with them. Then Julia is going to step in and take over and take you through some of the um, exciting information about our syllabuses and support resources and apps and everything else we do. Um, and then we'll finish by talking about how we work with teachers, how we support teachers, what resources or publications are available, what professional development and training is available, and then obviously time for questions at the end. Happy to move on? That sounds good. Right, here we go. Slide number <laughs> one. So here we go, a did you know question. This is like my starter at the beginning of the lesson. Did you know? Here's some information about Trinity. Did you know that we are um, not just a music board, but we're a multi-subject board and we offer qualifications um, in music, of course, but also drama and dance. We, uh, uh, the Arts Award runs from us and we have a big department running English language ex exams as well. Um, Music was first, our first love was always music and started out back in the 1870s. Um, and we're now working with um, about 850,000 candidates every year in around 70 countries um, across the globe. So we work with lots of teachers, lots of learners and in lots of places. And it's actually really interesting working for a multi-subject board because there is so much that you learn in terms of pedagogy and principles and processes from other subjects. It's amazing how similar yet how different uh, subjects even within the performing arts um, uh, area can be. Um, but what unites us, I think, are three principles. Uh, and the first two of those are uh, things that we talk about quite a lot across all of our subjects, and they are performance and communication. And we talk about performance and communication being at the heart of all of our qualifications in, for Trinity. Now, that kind of sounds obvious for music, performance especially, but I think when we talk about performance and communication in music, we're not just talking about the process of presenting or playing music, although that is, of course, at the core of the grade, but performing in the sense of real, authentic music making or musicking, if you're familiar with that term. Um, and we hope that exams encourage authentic and personalised music making, where um, a learner's musical identity is encouraged and communicated, rather than potentially just being suppressed through um, the accurate playing of dots on the page. So what we're really aiming for goes beyond the playing of your clarinet to really communicating your musical ambitions and identity and beliefs through your performance in your exam. And that is true for music as it is for the rest of the performing arts and even English language. The other principle is something I'm going to talk about in a minute, and um, um, as that one perhaps is the central um, principle to all of our work, and I'll come to that uh, just in a moment. Um, but to continue my bit of trivia, um, there's often confusion about who Trinity College London and Trinity Laban are, or Trinity College of Music, if you were there previous to 10 years ago. Um, and 
Trinity College London used to be part of uh, Trinity College of Music, the conservatoire that used to be situated up in, um, in um, Marlebone and now down in Greenwich. And they, in the 90s, split out to become uh, the awarding arm of Trinity. And then it became a big organisation in its own right. So we have great links with the conservatoire and the fantastic teaching and learning that goes on there. We have um, about um, 150 people actually working over the UK for Trinity just for music and it's some, uh, sometimes a hidden workforce who actually are frontline people who have the um, most uh, direct contact with our teachers and learners and they're our representatives and they're the people that run the exam centres and take your bookings and answer your questions um, and all those sorts of things um, to make the exams happen. Um, and the last thing to tell you uh, is that Trinity's, we, we've sort of split in the UK. We've got a head office in central London, but we have a UK and Ireland office based in Croydon. Um, and I think that's important to tell you because um, we understand the importance of context when it comes to teaching and learning. It would be very easy to be a sort of central Western export from one office in central London to the rest of the world. And actually that's something we strongly don't believe in. We believe in learn, teaching and learning being situated in the communities in which it happens. And what I mean by that is that no matter what the grade looks like, the learning and the teaching that leads to it will be different wherever it happens. So we deliberately split out our UK and Ireland office so that we could really think about how the exams are most relevant and best supported um, in the UK and Ireland. And we have a similar office in India, in Singapore, in etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So Trinity has become over time a truly global organisation that understands and values the importance of local context. Fran, if I can just jump in, only because, of course, I work up in a central London office um, because all of the syllabuses, everything we do with Music's International, and the part of Trinity that I work with closely is Trinity College London Press, who were formed, I think, back in 2016 and form now our own music publishing organisation. And so you'll see that all our new graded books come out of TCLP and also they are creating a whole wealth of new books, things like piano stories recently that were really well illustrated, set up deliberately for young learners. So that's something new and fantastic that's come out of uh, that sort of central Trinity hub and is now out there looking at music publishing and the way in which all of our books and resources can go across the world and meet all sorts of different needs. And that's true actually and there, yep. are some, there are starting to be some regional versions of books and yep. um, books created by teachers and representatives in different countries and I think that's quite exciting because it gives the local teaching context as near as it's under the exams. Yeah. Um, and Something that we talk about in this context is positive impact. And we do talk about this across the organisation. But this is incredibly important for us in music because we talk about, we recognise that an exam will always have some influence or impact on the teaching and learning which leads to it. Um, the degree of, to which that happens, I think, varies hugely. But we know that what we do um, will impact and influence what happens leading up to it. And we take that responsibility quite seriously because it can be a tool for great good or a tool for great destruction, I think, um, if handled badly. So this is what we these are the things we think about when we're considering positive impacts of our exams at Trinity. And the first is that we recognise that grade exams are just one part of the journey in instrumental learning, that they are not the entire sum of the instrumentalist who is using them, that they provide some sort of structure and resource and pathway through instrumental learning, but not the whole thing. There are other things that happen for learners who are, who are learning their instruments. They provide a useful kind of benchmarking process. So those summative assessment opportunities tell you where a learner is at a point in time, a snapshot of how things went on that day. But we do recognise that the exams don't represent the whole story, that there, are, there is other musical learning happening at home, in school, in bands, in, in all sorts of places, and that an exam can promote 
a particular definition of progress, which, if you're not careful with a graded exam, can focus very strongly on just technical um, facility or learning to play things better and faster. And actually, a developing musician is developing a whole host of holistic musical skills and knowledge. Um, and a grade sometimes will only touch on parts of that. So, although we believe that our exams are obviously great and a very, very useful and valuable part of instrumental learning, we do also recognise that they are not the whole thing. And because of that, we've carefully thought about what sits in our syllabuses and in our products and um, portfolio to make sure that they only promote positive things in teaching and learning. Um, so I thought I'd just give you a couple of examples because I think that's quite a that's quite a bold claim to make, I think. So um, one of the things we uh, spend a lot of time thinking about is, the, is ensuring that there is space for creativity in instrumental learning. Um, a colleague of mine has often been quoted as saying, look, you can get through all your grades and by the time you get there, all you've learned to 24 pieces. And that's a very sad view of a kind of a music mm. exam engagement. But you would hope that the grade forms part of a much broader um, learning process that's happening. But what can happen is that it, teaching can perhaps sometimes narrow or focus in on an exam as is very natural to do. And if within the exam we don't make sure there are opportunities for things like creativity, um, then it would be easy for those things to be lost in a, in a weekly lesson. So Julie is going to talk about this in a bit more detail, so I won't go through it in, in, in any depth now, but we have um, opportunities for um, improvising and composing to be included in our exams, so that if that's something that you are exploring with your learners on a, on a you know, weekly basis, then those things can be honoured and assessed in their exam as well. Um, Another example of the positive impact that we're trying to promote is through our marking criteria. Um, and I know John Holmes talked uh, very articulately about diagnostic marking um, and how it works with the AB and Trinity has um, the same approach of a diagnostic marking scheme. Um, and our criteria is split into uh, different uh, aspects of musicianship um, and allows learners to be recognised for the different strengths they might have in their um, in their ability so far. So one of those is that we slightly we have a heavier weighting for um, communication in our marking. We want to really um, promote the business of communicating musically in your playing. So we weight that slightly more heavily. Um, so that's we hope that through that through um, putting an emphasis on that in the exam, that's something that will be looked at in the teaching. Um, we, have, we talk a lot at Trinity about flexibility. And by flexibility, we mean having a range of choices and opportunities to, cert, to suit learners of all types and dispositions. So it allows teachers to select the um, components of the exam that suits the learner they're working with in the best way possible because what we want to do is assess the best. We don't want to make learners jump through hoops and take marks off. What we want to do is be to be able to honour and celebrate the best of their music making. And I know Julia's going to talk a bit more about flexibility in a little while too. And then this last bullet is probably for me and certainly my area of work one of the most important and the idea of exams understanding their social impact I think is something that no one board would claim to have cracked yet because graded exams come with 150 years worth of sort of historical baggage I suppose and music learning and music making and music itself has changed so much in that time um, and I think across all of the boards and particularly at Trinity there's a growing awareness of the power that grades have in, in a learner's journey, that they can promote and perpetuate certain views or practices um, of instrumental learning. Um, and it's really important that we ensure that the views that we perpetuate are the right ones. So, for example, 50 years ago, if you had looked at our syllabuses, it would have been full of mostly Western classical music. Um, and that was it. That's what people chose from. And if you look at our grades now, we have an enormous range of styles and genres. We have music that promotes certain pedagogies like group learning. We have music that can be engaged with learners on their own without a teacher. So we're thinking about how the exams promote certain ways and understandings of music learning. 
we have, we call these our values with a capital V. These are kind of key principles behind the music work we do. And I think they sort of do what they, you know, they do what they, sort of they do on the table, whatever the expression is. Um, and the first is that we do believe that Trinity's music is for everyone. Um, and that, of course, has huge implications for things like access and inclusion and diversity. And what we've talked about a lot at Trinity is, yes, we have been, until now, working very hard for equality within our exams to try and make them as accessible um, to as many people as we can but actually what we now should be striving for is real equity where we're not where we move beyond having to make adjustments for people or to find ways for people to engage who may not be able to otherwise to thinking about qualifications that start with access and inclusion at their heart so we are thinking very hard about that at Trinity at the moment and something that we're um, welcoming input in uh, at, at, at this time. We talk about Trinity Music encouraging creativity and that is creativity as in sort of big C creativity, creating things like comp compositions and improvisations, but also encouraging creative processes, creative thinking and a really as well creative teaching so thinking about how teachers can be creative and the pedagogies they create between them and their pupils and we talk about it being personal and that is to an extent the idea that trinity is flexible and can be tailored to individual pupils but also that it honors personal musical identities it honors the way in which people make music on their own or with others and it doesn't ask them to uh, move away from that personal music making to prepare for an exam but it tries to overlay the exams and qualifications on top of what it means to be um, behaving musically and what that means for each individual learner so that really is our um, our credo that's what sits behind what we do um, for music and we certainly don't think we've nailed it in all of those respects yet and it's a journey that will continue but one that definitely sits behind um, what we're doing at the moment so having talked about our uh, educational principles here's some stuff around our principles and commitments as an awarding organization so we are highly regulated, we um, are compliant with Ofqual and, and other international regulatory bodies and we have, um, we have a huge team of people sitting in the office at the Bluefin <laughs> making sure that we really do comply. Um, interestingly, I think, uh, and this was certainly different for me from other um, regulated organisations I've worked for, is that um, Trinity sees the business of compliance as the kind of the, the minimum amount that we should be doing. So it's not that we are striving to be compliant, but that being compliant is the least we should do. And then on top of that, we should be thinking about how to make our um, qualifications even more valid, even more reliable, even more robust, so that they are things that can be accessed and are um, able, that the range of learners we work with are able to engage with them. So um, we had that running behind us at all times, so they're snapping at your heels usually, do yeah, you know, isn't it? Actually, the, <laughs> the other thing about um, thinking about the off core regulation, for, for us working in syllabuses, thinking about what it is that the teachers and learners see and get in their hands, um, the Ofqual mark is really important internationally and it actually, it, it even gives, for those of you in the UK, it, it gives that sense of international recognition. It's a qualification that has recognition, it has credibility elsewhere in the world and actually the more that we have to look and we build our syllabuses and we, we talk to people, we have to talk to people all over the world but it's, it's a great thing to do and we talk to teachers and learners and they're always giving us their ideas but one of the things that we start to notice is just how important that community of musicianship is and and so I think the the, the international recognition of off call absolutely means that everybody's got this qualification that really means something and the more you look across the world the more you know people over in India and Singapore they know what a grade five is they know all of this fantastic repertoire um, and so it's yeah, it, it actually has become something that helps us build more international qualifications. And part of our um, off-call stuff that we do is um, obviously looking at how we work with examiners and train and recruit our examiners. Um, and robust, I think, is the only word we can use, use here. <laughs> it's not exciting. It's not. It's not varied. It's robust. It is. If you have, um, I know some of our teaching community have applied and gone through and trained as examiners. You'll know that 
even the process of recruitment, which is over a year long, um, is very detailed and very well supported. And our examiners go through a, a continual cycle of training in CPD. And that's for two reasons. It's for standardisation, to make sure that everybody is marking in the same way, no matter where they're running the exams. But it's also um, about... Um, it's also about how we interact with our teachers and learners. So it's about the experience of our candidates and making sure that um, as far as we can, that the exam isn't a frightening place, that the exam is somewhere to go and perform at your best and show the examiner what you can do in a kind of mini performance, um, rather than being something to be frightened and, 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 and scared of. So that's something that is built right into our examiner training. Um, and this has been touched on in other um, uh, presentations, but it is really worth saying again that grades 6 to 8 are powerful qualifications. These guys are heavy hitters. They carry UCAS points. Yeah. And if you've got um, learners who are applying to university or other um, HE um, uh, organisations, then make sure they know that their 6 to 8s can be, um, those UCAS points can be counted towards their applications. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's a big deal. And if you know anything about um, uh, the performance tables, which is a, a school's accountability measure for state-funded schools in England, you'll know that Progress 8 is a kind of main measure for schools and um, schools are very keen to encourage qualifications that carry Progress 8 points. And Grade 6 to 8 for Trinity carry Progress 8 points. So even if a school teacher has um, children who are learning in Key Stage 4 who perhaps aren't engaging with a Key Stage 4 music qualification, like GCSE or BTEC, that actually if they are learning their instrument and working at grades six to eight, then those Progress 8 points can be counted towards the school's um, Progress 8 quota. So they're really important things to know about the qualifications. And I think the last point on that, and that this is something that sets us apart from most of our competitors, is that all of our grades are regulated and that includes the initial grade. So when you're looking at when a, uh, an organisation like a school might be looking at things like public funding, then even our lowest pre-grade one grade is part of the um, part of the qualifications portfolio that can be accessed through public funding. So there are some important things to know, I think, about um, the graded exams and what they can offer learners as a passport to other types of learning. My last um, thing to tell you before I um, hand over to Julia, I think, is that um, we've, talk, we've been talking about grades, but actually Trinity does quite a lot uh, in music aside from the grades. We have uh, grades initial to grade eight in a myriad instruments, um, instruments that <laughs> I never expected to see turning yeah. up for grade exam. It's, yeah. it's great. The portfolio is very, very wide and very varied. But we also run something called certificate exams, which run at three levels at the moment, don't they, Julia? Yeah, that's right. Um, and you can take a certificate exam as a soloist or as an ensemble. Mm -hmm. So those certificate exams sit at roughly grade three, grade five and grade eight. And they are set up to be mini recital exams. So they don't have the same requirement for scales and um, supporting mm -hmm. tests. They are the opportunity for your pupils who are just the consummate performer to go and get a qualification to um, to uh, uh, celebrate what they can do in terms of a mini recital. The other thing with certificate exams actually is that we find that people, uh, adult learners, love them. Oh, yes. So they're performance only and so there's no requirement for the technical work um, and the supporting tests which I'll talk about later. So um, and performance only actually when you're an adult learner you just want to be able to play your instrument, enjoy playing your instrument the certificate exam will give you recognition for that. So we often have groups of learners, groups of young learners, because of course music making doesn't happen in isolation. No, no, no. <laughs> the, um, the adult learner as well. So certificate exams are really nice performance only place that often gets a little bit overlooked. And we do, we talk, don't we, a lot about a kind of a zigzag pathway through yeah, Trinity's portfolio. Yeah. So you might start off doing your initial and your grade one and then jump to the first certificate exam and maybe back to your grade four. So there are you don't have to climb one ladder. You can mix and match as suits your learners. Um, we also uh, run theory exams, which are always a glaring omission from that page. I'll be in trouble for that. But we have a we have a fantastic suite of theory exams, um, which um, 
uh, accompanied by some brilliant theory books, really accessible, really friendly theory books, as friendly as theory can be. They are friendly theory books. And it's worth knowing that a Trinity Grade 5 theory exam is something that you can present even if you want to do your Grade 6 ABRSM, all right? <laughs> I'll say it here. It is. <laughs> Ours is you can be doing um, Trinity theory in order to access the higher grades A, B. So, yeah. you know, it's out there. Yes. We said it, we've been brave. Um, so there's the theory exams. And then we also have a suite of different diplomas. So we have um, performing diplomas, which sit at levels four, six and seven. So these are um, higher level performance um, exams that carry a lot of international recognition. And they're post nominals. Letters post -nominals. after your name. Um, and we have some teaching diplomas too that sit at um, those three levels. Um, we have composing and theory diplomas if they are your thing. If you are looking at um, theory or composition at a high level, then the diplomas are excellent because mm. of the sorts of feedback you get through taking those exams. And then we have last but certainly not least, our certificate for music educators, which um, I'm going to talk about a little at the end, so I won't go into that now. So not just the grades, there's a lot of other things available for people at Trinity as well. And it's also worth mentioning that we have the amazing Arts Award, which is operated by mm. Trinity, um, and you can do your Arts Award in music. So um, that's something for people to look at too, I think. Yeah. So I'm going to be quiet now and hand over to Julia, who's going to talk about the music syllabuses and give you the stuff that you want to know. <laughs> well, hopefully. Um, what I'm not going to do is uh, talk exactly to the slides because you've got everything there to be able to read. And actually, what I'd love everybody to do is um, just go and take a look. If you're not necessarily a Trinity teacher, the syllabuses are nice and easy to find on the website um, and our newest syllabus is in the newest format at the moment our piano uh, singing brass and all of our rock and pop so um yeah so go and have a look um what i'm going to talk about as we gradually go through these slides is um how we think about the syllabuses how we think about um what it is that the teachers and learners see so Everybody that, that works at Trinity, all of my team, um, we think about it in two ways. One is the syllabus, the core thing. Uh, what is it that people learn? What is it that people, uh, what, what is the kind of progression that they see through the grades? And then the second thing, which has as much importance for us, is how do we support people to do it? Because one of the things I remember from learning music as a youngster was you'd know about your grade one or your grade five, you'd you'd never look at the syllabus as a, a candidate ever. <laughs> um, your teacher would and they would guide you and they would tell you. And as we started to think about these newly designed syllabuses that we introduced from last year was really simplify it and make it engaging. So let's we, we know that learners learn better when they know what it is that they're aiming for. So well, and also when they have more choice. So we wanted people to be able to look at these syllabuses and find them more engaging. The other thing that was a bit of a personal crusade for many of us was to be able to open up that syllabus and see everything you need for that grade on the pages right in front of you, rather than having to refer to page 27 uh, to find out what was needed for each test. We wanted to try and condense it to make it clear. And we've had some lovely feedback um, from press and from teachers uh, to tell us that this is a nice, clear format. So hopefully, like I say, go and have a look and let us know. We always want to improve them. I'm going to give you a three second overview into what goes on in a Trinity exam. Again, because I'd rather talk about some of those slightly more engaging things and wider contextual music things that Fran related to. We have a uh, repertoire. So candidates will come in, they will play their pieces. Uh, we have technical work and we have supporting tests. Um, and those three elements comprise the exam. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about repertoire in a minute and the technical work, um, mainly just to put it in context. I kind of want to thread back to what Fran said right at the beginning, which is the exams fundamentally are about performance and communication. Um, and everything that we put into these syllabuses comes back to that point is ultimately, you know, as a young aspiring musician or, you know, a musician of any age, you want to be able to play. Some of us don't love getting up on stage. Some of us adore it. <laughs> um, but 
But you want to be able to play a piece from start to finish. You want to feel good about it. You want to know that that's something that you can do and achieve. I don't think I ever, and Fran, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I never wanted to stand on stage at the Carnegie Hall or the Wigmore Hall and play the best D flat minor in the world. <laughs> no, that was one of my no. dreams as a child. No. And yet my <laughs> teachers knew, and I knew fundamentally how important that was. Um, what we try to do in the exams is bring that technique down to being something that's genuinely relevant. One of the misconceptions of uh, Trinity exams is that because scales can be an option in the technical work, that somehow there's less rigour. Somehow we're ducking the ability uh, to do scales, arpeggios, chords, chord progressions and so on. It's not the case. Um, we don't let people <laughs> escape it because we build um, scalic passages, chordal passages, that knowledge of, of specific instrument technique into the technical work at its heart. So perhaps a student doesn't want to play A natural minor, A melodic minor, uh, this time at grade three, maybe at grade five, we might, you know, that might be something that's better for them or they understand the importance of technique because they're that little bit older. But um, what it, it doesn't mean is that you get away with playing mm -hmm. scales all the way up to grade eight. Um, we always say to teachers, particularly when they question this a lot, and I do understand why, um, we say that you still can. You still can. If you feel that scales and uh, are absolutely an excellent, rigorous way to do it, your students are engaged with it, of course teach them. And of course put that into the exam. So it is there. That it's optional is a way of understanding that people's come in all shapes and sizes, musicians come in all shapes and sizes. No one should not do their grade three just because they've struggled with C-sharp minor. Um, however, <laughs> they will have other technical work in there. So the technical work is designed to be authentic to the instrument. I can't tell you, um, and I won't, it would take too long, uh, the technical work that exists for every single instrument in our syllabus because it's not the same. There is for each instrument a very specific compulsory um, technical exercise. Um, I'll give you some examples. For brass, it's lip flexibility. For strings, it's bowing. Um, for our new electronic keyboard syllabus, um, it will be uh, chord exercises, a knowledge and understanding of, of common chord progressions. Um, that's new electronic keyboard out Thursday, is it, Julie? Out Thursday. <laughs> um, <laughs> spoiler. Mm -hmm. um, but but it's, it's highly authentic to the instrument. Uh, there are scales and arpeggios as options for every grade and every instrument. So no, you can't you can't necessarily escape them, and you shouldn't have to. Um, and we always do technical exercises. So technical exercises can be selected as an option instead of the scales and arpeggios. But it's it is a flexible way of helping students engage with technique. But what those exercises do is they relate directly to the repertoire. So they pull out and extract the technique that is in that performance-based repertoire. They also force you to uh, engage in some scalic passages that are often linked to the same tonal centers that the repertoire are in, the same tonal centers that you would have explored had you done scales. So what we're doing is encouraging people to engage in technique through performance. Um, so hopefully that allays some of the fears about why it is that we make uh, scales optional. Uh, it's because they can't escape the other technical things. Um, a tiny bit about our repertoire. Um, we don't bind the list by style and genre. There are lists, um, but we want, again, we want candidates to really love playing. We know that when people come to music, they start and engage with the kind of music that they know. And then once you start to study music, you begin to understand the value and the beauty and the technical wonder, harmonic wonder in all of these other genres that you may not have seen before. And so our lists remain very varied so that students and teachers can engage people with their musical learning, with a variety of things they know, styles that they can enjoy. Um, we don't 
clearly define them. Uh, we don't force people down these routes, but our newer syllabuses try and explore the kinds of repertoire, again, that are authentic to the instrument that will ensure that you can build those authentic skills if you want to go up to grade eight and beyond. So um, our brass, for example, incorporates brass band repertoire, jazz, orchestral extracts, because we know that young musicians that go on and explore uh, careers or even you know, joining youth orchestras, brass bands, brass ensembles, this is the kind of repertoire that they engage with. So we want to reflect what goes on in the wider musical context for them. Sorry. Oh, is that the right one? There we go. Okay, so um, our actually, I've, I've been really silly. I haven't talked about supporting tests, which I will. Those four do remain the same. I'll go back quickly. Um, the supporting tests remain the same. Um, so there are four to select from. Um, we allow students to have a think about whether they want to look at oral, sight reading, improvisation or musical knowledge. Um, and that's down to the grade that you're doing in the candidate choice. Um, you'll choose two of them. The reason that we introduce improvisation and it's something that particularly, you know, as a classical trained musician, it's something I find quite uh, quite nerve-wracking, um, is that, as Fran said earlier, we want to encourage musical creativity. So if your students show a certain aptitude or they enjoy just coming to their instrument and playing, there is something there to help you as teachers develop them if that's what, what you want to do. We also recognise that many of us as classical musicians weren't taught improvisation. I'm going to hold my hands up and admit it. Um, and so part of the resources that we create is about helping teachers and learners come to improvisation if you want to. Um, likewise, we have the opportunity if for one of your repertoire pieces for the exam you want to compose something. Again, some students have amazing skill in this area. We've put a lot of resources and we will continue to do so. Um, put resources on the site to support those people. Lots of teachers like to teach composition as well. It's a fab musical skill. Um, lots of learners begin to think about wanting to write their own things. And so again, we put these in as options in our syllabus. Fran was talking about flexibility earlier. Um, so that if you've got students that want to explore these things, or perhaps you do as teachers, um, there's something there to help broaden that range of musical skills and I, I, it threads back into the positive impact which is we want to be able to offer music exams that reflect the kind of music making that goes on and the kind of music making that people enjoy. It's really lovely actually when you are running an exam and a candidate turns up to perform a piece that they've written themselves. Yeah. I mean it's it's brilliant, it's a really lovely option in the exam I yeah. think. Yeah, no it is. Hey Julia! Well, as, well as, yes, West, Fran. as well as Western classical folk, orchestral, um, and other... Let other... me stop you right there, Fran. <laughs> Do we offer anything else for learners in working in other styles and genres? I think we might. Um, so, because I've flipped through a few slides and have already given the game away, and of course, I'm sure it's so popular now, everyone knows, um, we have our rock and pop syllabuses. Um, popular musicians learn, engage, have different skills and styles in slightly different ways. There's been a lot written on it. I think if I allowed uh, Fran for, for us to start a conversation about how popular musicians learn, we could go on forever, so we, we won't. Enough, yeah. We won't. <laughs> <laughs> Next time. Um, yeah. Next time. <laughs> we have five of these, one for each instrument. Uh, guitar, drums, bass, keys and vocal. Um, the, the real the really exciting thing about working on this syllabus were the, the real songs. Um, when we came up with that strap line, it came quite naturally. Um, the, the big thing behind these syllabuses is that uh, they're the songs that popular musicians play, they're the stuff you hear in the charts, they're, there is a mixture of rock and pop styles and genres that really stretch you know, right back to the early stuff, you've got some 1950s blues in there, um, all the way up to, now I have to <laughs> think of one that's that, <laughs> right up to today's charts. Um, but there are, if, there are hundreds of songs in there, in all seriousness. Um, they have 
authentically recorded, stem recorded backing tracks um, by session musicians that are out there working in the industry at the moment, which is a great thing. And you can see um, lots of those session musicians talking about the videos in our music resources, in our practice room. So like, like we've done with all of our classical syllabuses, our rock and pop syllabuses, we have these digital supporting resources. So it's uh, help to understand for the classical it's uh, you know improvisation own composition starters we flip through um, for uh, rock and pop we've got lots of demo videos I think I've got a list coming up later on um, and so that supports really important there's an awful lot that goes up on the web all the time to help access these syllabuses um, they come with the backing tracks, as I say, uh, they're all authentic and they're downloadable uh, from Soundwise, so there's a, a place and an app to get them from. And then I'll talk very briefly on session skills. The supporting tests, for want of a better expression, are called session skills in rock and pop, and it's because improvisation and playback, so the ability to listen to and reproduce um, music orally and then sort of represent that in technique is absolutely what you need to do in the studio and on stage if you're a professional mm -hmm. musician. Um, these are the kinds of skills that are required and as I said before, you know, as a classical musician, improvisation wasn't something that I did. Um, and But this, these kinds of skills are hard baked into these services. Um, it's It's all about authenticity with rock and pop. It's all about saying to the candidates, this is the music that you hear on the radio. This is the kind of music that we know you love. Here are the skills that sit behind it. And, and this is a great way to get young learners, well, learners of all ages, interested in what it is that sits behind contemporary music. And it's worth saying that um, all of our rock and pop grades um, carry the same weighting and are regulated in, uh, in exactly yeah. the same way as our classical and jazz grades. So, Absolutely. and they still carry Lucas points, Progress 8 points, etc. So, there's no difference between um, the value of those to a, a classical grade. Absolutely. Um, I think I've talked a bit about session skills, support for teachers and learners. I mentioned this earlier. Um, syllabus is a huge bit of what we do. But another bit that's growing all the time is making sure we're supporting teachers and learners. We, we kind of split this up into three main categories. Things we know will help support the syllabus. So if you want to know a bit about improvisation or, or composing um, your own pieces, there are some resources to get you started on that. There. there are also some great videos. We, we use some really, really eminent, exciting, Sort of almost genre non-specific professionals who work absolutely in the industry. Um, so we've got orchestral performers who also um, we've got a lovely video the guy who works um, doing the music for for musicals, West End musicals, as well as being a session musician. There's it's a whole wealth of sort of portfolio career musicians sharing their stories, and they were the ones helping us build the syllabus. So we split it up into what you need to know to get through the syllabus in each of those tests. Um, support for teaching and learning, you know, how teachers teach, how learners learn. And then lastly, putting the music in its musical and social context. So for rock and pop, next slide, um, we've got demo videos created by the session musicians you hear on those backing tracks talking about their own uh, personal experience. Some of them have even played on the original tracks that you're hearing um, or, or that you might be playing for your own grade. Uh, we've got lots of video tips from young musicians. We've created Spotify playlists, but we've also got teaching rock and pop tips um, handouts and articles because um, it's quite a discrete skill and I know that lots of musicians want to learn how to do all sorts of things across a range of styles and genres. I talked earlier about Trinity College London Press uh, so go and have a look at their website and have a look at all the books available and lastly I'll talk very briefly about our app um, so what our app allows you to do is really become the producer, mix your own version of the backing track. Uh, there's some new functionality being released very, very soon, which will allow you to record your own part so you can actually be part of the band. 
Um, internationally, this app's doing really well. Um, and I think it's because we're starting to get young people engaged in not only the, the genre, the repertoire, the music, the pieces, um, but also thinking about the technology and the creativity that sits right at the heart of contemporary music. I think I should probably stop, Fran, I'm sorry. We can work <laughs> lyrical, so I could go on. on. Yeah. We've just got a couple, there are only two or three slides to finish before we leave some time for questions. And one is just to talk about, continuing to talk about how we support and work with teachers and learners. It's just to mention um, working with learners with specific needs. So we, like any exam board, will um, uh, enable reasonable adjustments, as they're known, um, for an exam to help a learner that might have some specific needs um, to, let, to help them to get into the exam room and perform their exam and they're sort of well documented and, and well understood but it, I did want to point out that we we do consider things on a case-by-case -case basis wherever we can and we're really keen to support all learners um, so I would I would strongly recommend that if you have um, if you're working with a pupil and you're not sure whether they'll be able to access a graded exam in the format that it runs, please do get in touch with us to talk individually about your pupils because we're really open to discussion and trying new things wherever we possibly can. Um, the other thing is that we do have this range of qualifications to choose from. So if a grade isn't immediately useful to you, then a certificate exam mm. likely or something similar. Mm. So we are striving always to try and improve um, the access that we um, provide to all of our qualifications. Um, a quick a quick um, UK plug I think for the UK and Ireland office that um, if you want to enter for exams and you haven't done that before then check the website to find out who your local rep is because they are the font of all knowledge they'll be able to tell you everything you need to know about starting Trinity exams and if you're um, looking at doing a rock and pop exam you can actually um, enter online on the website too mm -hmm. and we are as a sneak uh, Bit of a bit of information for you. We are looking at full online entry, and that's coming quite soon. Dot dot dot. Watch this space. Um, if you've got questions or queries about the syllabus, the website is full of information and downloads and errata and resources. So do check our website, which we'll give you the um, address for in a moment. We run a lot, a lot, a lot of face-to-face -face training and workshops for teachers. We have a team of brilliant workshop leaders and animateurs that run that for us. Um, so if you do want to arrange some... To oh my goodness, no. I'm so sorry. Somebody, somebody's alerting me to something. Um, um, if you do want to look at some workshops or training for teachers that you work with, then please get in touch with our Croydon office. And the last thing is just to... I, the biggest piece of support I think that we offer at the moment for teachers is our level four certificate for music educators, which is a, a regulated qualification that is run by centres. So we have people like, um, oh no, if I hang on, if I mention one or two, I'll be in trouble you for not mentioning sure. everyone. Yeah, I'll Great that. So we have a number of um, very, very high profile and uh, fantastic music organisations who run the Level 4 Certificate for Music Educators and you go and study a course with them which we certificate. And it's a fantastic programme um, which just is around um, encouraging reflection and looking at all aspects of music teaching and learning in whatever context you do it. So it doesn't matter if you are a, an L HLTA in a primary school supporting music or a community musician or someone training to do their PGCE or uh, uh, someone in the RAF going back into the world of work. Um, there are, the Certificate for Music Educators is a fantastic resource and so do check the website for the centres that are, are running in your area. Here are some links. <laughs> <laughs> these are some of the right. Yes, these are some of the links that will take you to different parts of the website, and everything we've talked about can be found on on our website um, or uh, through one of these links. So please do go and have a dig round and download some resources and watch some videos and have a look at the syllabuses if there's something that you're not um, familiar with anyway. I think, I mean, we could do another couple of hours on this frame, yeah. but I've got a feeling the, um, we were well, told that the um, it will touch up at some two, point. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much, ladies, for that wonderful, wonderful presentation. Um, we have a few questions um, here. So if um, I'll go to the top, we'll get through as many as we can. And like we said, if there's um, questions we don't get to, um, rest assured, we will respond to you after the webinar. Yes, and we will hold up our hands to say that there are some people who hold specialist knowledge elsewhere in the organisation. We might have to just go back and check yeah, with them. Absolutely, so. yeah. 
Well, we like to claim we know everything. It's probably well. not true. Um, <laughs> So we should this start. one at the top about improvisation and keyboard rock and pop styles. So um, although we don't do a book at the moment uh, in keyboard rock and pop improvisation, one of the things that we are working on at the moment is looking at uh, resources to support contemporary music, rock and pop style improvisation. And we've actually got some articles planned on that. So do have a look at the practice room on the Trinity Rock um, website because we're going to start uploading some of those pretty soon. So hopefully um, that will give you a few ideas. Um, the other thing that you can do is if you have a look on the website and want to just give us a quick email or email the uh, customer services team in the UK, that actually comes straight through to our team. And we can always, we're always happy to make any other suggestions there rather than me you know, plugging a particular book and getting into all sorts of trouble. <laughs> Could we look at that, that one there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. I don't know, I think if you click on it, the rest of the question will come up, does it? Yeah, here we go. Um, online entry at the moment is just rolling out for the UK. Um, so um, it's, and, and it is rolling slowly because it's something that seems like it should be so simple, but actually you, you need, we need to get that right so that it really serves our teachers and candidates properly. So um, eventually that, that online entry will be available to the UK. Um, this one here about the syllabuses, can you get syllabuses via music shops? Um, I believe they are stocked in the music shops. I believe they are. We're oh. saying we're looking at each other with a frown to I say we think so. And one of our publishing from one of our colleagues from TCL Press is probably jumping up and down at the end of their computer Going. at the moment saying, Why don't you know? Um, we believe they always have been available mm. by the music shops, but if you can't get hold of them and need them, then please drop us a line at yeah. our um, uh, Croydon office and we'll we can sort something Yeah, out. the customer service team um, will definitely be able to help and like I say, they'll be able to get some sent out if you if you want hard copies, they're very good. Um, yeah. There's a question here that says, is it possible to have self-generated subtitles? Is that for the video? I or think it might be for the webinar. Making, uh, oh, for the webinar, you think? think? If, if the lady is still there, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you, could just, you could just elaborate slightly on your question, then um, uh, then that would be really useful and we'll, uh, we hopefully we'll answer that. Uh, in terms of the videos online, then there aren't at the moment, but um, you may be, um, there may be a specific uh, question there, so please do get in touch with us. Um, okay, there's there are quite a lot of questions coming through, and I've got a feeling we're not going to be able to pick them all off um, in the next two minutes. Um, so what we might do is, um, Freya, we can take these back with us, can't we? Is that right? Um, we will um, send you the questions, and if you can come back to us, we can distribute them. So we'll we'll get back to everyone. Um, thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you to you both, um, and we'll see you at another webinar soon.